was on August the 2nd that we snapped our last link with civilization when we left the steamer which had taken us upriver. Thereafter, we made our way by canoe and then overland through thick Amazonian forest. Our two learned companions contrived to bicker constantly throughout the journey whilst Lord John and myself endeavoured unsuccessfully to keep the peace. It was exactly one month to the day after leaving Manaus that Lord John and I realized that we were at last in the vicinity of the lost world. Oh, I'm exhausted. Hmm? Isn't it nearly time we rested, Lord John? Soon, young fella. Soon. Listen. What's that? War drums, I think. Yes, I've heard them before. They watch us every step of the way, you know. I didn't. But how can they? In this dense forest. Oh, they have their own ways. And they talk drum talk to each other, sort of pass us along. You'd be surprised. Do you hear the drums? No, no. They're not Walker Indians. Do you agree, Samory? No doubt, sir. Like all such tribes, I should expect to find them of polysynthetic speech and of Mongolian type. Polysynthetic, certainly. The Mongolian theory, I regard a deep suspicion. <laughs> Don't they frighten you, sir? Hearing the drums like that? Not at all, young man. Besides, we shall soon be in the land of Kuripiri. They don't dare to follow us there. As for the Mongolian theory, I should have thought that even a limited knowledge of comparative anatomy would have helped to verify it. No doubt, sir, a limited knowledge would have that effect. However, right. Look there! Look! Look! Did you see it? Did you see it through the trees? There it goes! Look! Look, Samily! Did you see it? The pterodactyl! <laughs> Hello, fiddlestick. It was a stork, if ever I saw one. A pterodactyl. Damn it, man, you must be blind as well as me. I say, I'm alone. Just a minute. What is it? Well, now, it seems to me these two scientific johnnies are too caught up in their own arguments to take notice of any dangers. If they're going to want wet nursing, young fella. It's going to be our job to do it. Can you shoot? About average territorial standard. Good Lord. Bad as that. But look here. What's all this about? Well, Malone, I happen to have my glasses focused on that creature before it got up over the trees. Up to now, I've never really been sure whether our Professor Challenger was a madman or a liar. But now, I know different. Why? We held a council of war. Professor Challenger, as always, presided. I need not say that on the occasion of my last visit, I exhausted every means of climbing the cliffs. And where I failed, I do not think that anyone else is likely to succeed, for I am something of a mountaineer. I had none of the appliances of a rock climber with me, but I've taken the precaution of bringing them now. With their aid, I am positive I could climb the detached pinnacle to the summit. But so long as the main cliff overhangs, it's useless to attempt descending that. There seems to be only one sensible course. Let us split up into two parties, eastward and westward, along the base of the cliffs, and seek for a practical point for our ascent. I agree with Professor Summerley. The odds of this plateau is of no great size, and if we travel round it, we shall either find an easy way up or come back to the point from which we first started. There is no easy way up, Lord John. But I admit that there is a point at which ascent is possible. How do you know, sir? Because, Professor Summerley, my predecessor, Maple White, actually made such an ascent. How otherwise could he have seen the monster which he sketched in his notebook? There you reason somewhat ahead of the proved facts, Professor Challenger. I admit your plateau because I've seen it. But I have not as yet satisfied myself that it contains any form of life whatever. What you admit, sir, or what you do not admit is really of inconceivably small importance. I'm glad to perceive that the plateau itself has actually obtruded itself upon your intelligence. Now, gentlemen, 
I think we cannot do better than to commence our scouting expedition. Leaving our Negro servant, Zambo, to guard the camp, we set out. Challenger and Summerlee, with our three Indian bearers, took the easterly direction. Lord John and myself, accompanied by Gomez and Manuel, our two half-breed guides, went towards the west, through a rocky country of tree and bamboo, and always in the shadow of those gigantic cliffs. Sir, so, young fella. Yes, Lord How far John? do you reckon we've come now? From the camp? Yes. A mile or two, perhaps. Well, that's far enough. I think turn round, young fella. We're heading back to the camp. Any special reason, Lord John? The light's failing. It'll be pitch dark in half an hour, and I don't like the feel of this place. I've been thinking the same thing myself. Only I, I didn't like to admit... I mean, I couldn't explain. You don't have to explain. Look up there at those cliffs. I am looking. There's life up there. Bad life. Life that keeps watching us. When I think of that thing I saw flapping up out of the trees in the forest. Oh, it had a 20-foot wing spread and it had teeth like bread knives. If we... If we wait a minute. Where are those two half-breeds? I don't know. I haven't seen them for the past ten minutes. Gomez! Manuel! You don't think... It's getting dark, young fella. Gomez! Manuel! Senores! Senores! It's all right. That's Gomez. What's the matter? Oh, senores, the other senor with the black beard, he has said there is a way up these cliffs. Manuel and I, we think we have found it. What's that? We show you, yes? Show us what? On these cliffs, I show you. We find what you call an arrow drawn in white chalk. Maple white for a fiber. We follow this arrow where it point. And, and we come to one opening in this rock of the cliff, an opening what you call a, a cleft. That's it, the cleft, one cleft, where the rock open up. You follow me, yeah? You bet your boots we follow you. Come on, Malone. Hello there. Hello there. You didn't expect an answer, do you? I don't know what to expect. It's only a kind of gorge cut in the rock, not very deep. Oh, John, it's blocked. A dead wall. Oh, no, it's not. Look. Where? Up the side of the wall, higher. Up there. Heap of stones, loose like a ruddy staircase. And on top of that... It looks like the mouth of a cave. It is the mouth of a cave. And another arrow drawn on the rock. Up those stones with you. Now, go on. Oh. Steady. Steady. Uh. Hey, mind those loose stones, young fella. Gomez. Manuel, you come too. Yes, senores. We come. It's the gateway to the land of monsters, laddie. Through the mouth of that cave, there's a tunnel up inside the cliffs as sure as you're born. Easy now. Here, look, let me give you a hand to the top. Go on, up you go. Oh. Now they can stop us now, young fellow. I defy anything or anybody on top of these cliffs to... What's wrong? Well, I hate eating my words, young fellow, when I'd barely put salt on them. But look there. You mean... It's blocks, that's all. The roof of the ruddy cave has fallen in. They're cut off by two tons of rock from the only way up. What was that? I don't know. It sounded like... Gomez, Manuel, is that the you laughed just now? Laugh, senor? Somebody laughed just then. I, I, I don't know, senor. Maybe it was uh, what Indian call a spirit of the woods that laughed. Never mind the spirit of the woods. Can't we dig away through that loose rock? No good, young fella. Why not? Well, you'd only start an avalanche at the barriers. Don't you touch it. And there isn't any way up. No, I'm afraid not. Come on. It's high time we were getting back to camp. Too much cast down to speak. We made our way back to the camp. One incident occurred, however, before we left the gorge, which is of importance in view of what came afterwards. We were at the bottom of the chasm, some 40 feet beneath the mouth of the cave, when a huge rock rose suddenly downwards and shot past us with tremendous force. We could not see where it had come from, but Gomez and Manuel, who were still at the opening of the cave, said it had flown past them and must have fallen from above. Looking upwards, we could see no sign of movement in the green jungle which topped the cliff. There could be little doubt, however, that the stone was aimed at us. So the incident surely pointed to some form of life upon the plateau. As we moved away, our minds were full of this new development and its bearing on our plans. 
When we reached the camp, we found the others waiting for us. And you're sure, Lord John, there is absolutely no chance of our clearing the fallen rocks? None at all. Pity. Great pity. As to the incident of the falling rock, it would merely seem to confirm my theory that some form of life does indeed exist on the plateau. The theory which I may add has already been proven by our own discoveries, and it seems... Stop a minute. What did he find? A human skeleton. A what? A human skeleton lying in a patch of bamboo, with the bamboo canes growing through its smashed ribs. Almost certainly the skeleton of a white man. I quite agree, and I don't like this. How did the skeleton get there? Can't you guess, Lord John? You mean this man fell from the top of the cliff? He fell, yes, or was thrown. This man, probably a friend or colleague of Maple White. We have no evidence of that. We have every evidence, sir. This man was running in blind terror from something which appeared to him monstrous or diabolical. He fell to his death on the sharp bamboo points... Or else he was taken by human hands. Human hands? Taken by human hands as I now take this skull of his from my knapsack and dropped over the edge of that cliff as I dropped the skull on the ground. So. Oh, Santa Maria. Will you now admit, Professor Samele, that there is malignant life on the plateau? I don't know. But does that matter now, sir? Matter, young man? Since we can't get to the top of the plateau. I beg your pardon. We can get to the top of the plateau. We can... You found... Ah. It. You mean you found a way up? I venture to think so. How? We can't climb the sheer face of the cliff. That's impossible. Agreed, Lord John, agreed. Then how in all blue blazes are you going to do it? Uh, will you permit me, gentlemen, to sit down on this log and address you as I might address a somewhat backward class? All right, get on with it. You will also, I hope, spare me your congratulations. My natural modesty forbids any such display. The inspiration, if I may term it so, came to me only ten minutes ago. I was thinking, oddly enough, of a paper read to the Edinburgh Zoological Society by a certain Dr. Illingworth. Oh, one moment, Professor Challenger. You spoke, Professor Summary? Were you by any chance referring to Dr. Angus Illingworth of Edinburgh? I was, sir. Is he a friend of yours? That charlatan, that insufferable mountebanker, a friend of mine? You agree, perhaps, that Dr. Illingworth has no sense? I agree with the utmost emphasis. His views on the wheeled and slates are entire purility. His insulting review of my last book occupied seven and a half pages of the zoological quarterly. Professor Summerley, shake hands. Professor Challenger, it's a pleasure. Young fellow, my lad, listen. Yes, Lord John. Oh, We've got it. Oh, God, all right. The password, Dr. Illingworth of Edinburgh. Whenever these two start spitting in each other's eye, just mention Dr. Illingworth of Edinburgh. Got it? Got it, Dr. John. You were telling us, Professor Challenger, how we could get to the top of the plateau. Now, uh, if we put the same question to Dr. Illingworth of Edinburgh... Dr. Illingworth, the great zoologist... He could probably tell us straight away. Tell us like a shot. And do you intimate, sir, that I can't? Look around you. Well? What do you see? Well, uh, I see a campfire, a load of provisions, line of red cliffs. Nothing else, my friend? Well, nothing will help us, no. You don't see, for instance, the pinnacle of rock there. The pinnacle of rock that rises as high as the plateau and has a huge tree on top of it. Well, that won't help us. You think not, Lord Jones? We've got rock climbing gear, yeah. We could get to the top of the pinnacle, yes. But even if we got there, we'd still be 40 feet from the edge of the plateau. We can never get across. We can at least all reach the summit. When we are up, I may be able to show you that the resources of my brain are by no means exhausted. It was towards noon the next day a brilliant burning day, that the last of us managed to crawl up on top of that pinnacle, a grassy space some 25 feet square. It was a hair-raising climb, to say the least. But now, at last, we were able to gaze across at that curious plateau. There it lay, the lost world, across the 40-foot gulf, green and silent, its trees glistening in the sun where it stretched away from us deep and sinister as a new continent. This is indeed curious. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. What, Professor Summerlee? This tree, Mr. Malone. You will please note the smooth bark and the small ribbed leaves. Tell me, are they not familiar to you? Why, it's a beech. Exactly, a beech tree. A fellow countryman in a far land. Not only a fellow countryman, my good sir, but also, if I may be allowed to enlarge your simile, an ally of the first value. 
This beech tree will be our savior. Ah, huh? George, a bridge. Exactly, my friend. A bridge. Where willpower and intellect go together, there's always a way out. A drawbridge had to be found, which could be dropped across the abyss. Behold it. There is our bridge, gentlemen. To the lost world. Brilliant, sir. The tree's a good wash. Sixty feet high. If it only falls the right way, it'll easily cross the chasm. Mr. Malone. Yes, sir? You, my young friend, have the thews and sinews. I think you will be the most useful at this task. I can hardly wait to begin, sir. One moment, Mr. Malone. I must beg that you will kindly refrain from thinking for yourself. You will do exactly as you are told. Now, I suggest that you make your first incision here. Really, Mr. Malone, can't you go any faster? Oh, easy now. The lad's doing his best. Oh, but this, sir, is a mere tree. It is a tree 60 feet high. It's got to fall exactly across the gulf with its edge on the other side. I have a presentiment, sir, that it won't. Won't what? Won't fall as we wish it. Oh. If it rolls over the edge and leaves us still without a bridge. You know, Professor Sumler, you're the cheeriest little ray of sunshine I ever did see. I state an obvious possibility, Roger. I tell you, man, it can't. Indeed, sir. And why not? Professor Challenger's calculations. I'm deeply suspicious of any calculations made by Professor Challenger on any subject. Indeed, sir. I repeat it, sir. And suppose the tree does fall as we wish it. How are we to get across? Sit us try the trunk of the tree and hop across. Oh, Over a thousand foot gulf under Dash it, man. There's no other way. Even on this big grass plot, I have an unsteady feeling in the legs, as though something were urging me onto the edge. I confess it without shame. So to cross that gulf on a He's tree going. trunk... Hallelujah! Got it! Stop dead on the edge, Professor Challenger. Shake hands. Well, it seems to me there's a lot of this indiscriminate handshaking going on, but by George, here's my hand, too. I remove my hat, gentlemen. I thank you deeply for this not unmerited tribute. The resources of a great brain, if I may modestly say so, are equal to any small obstacle. There is the bridge. There is the last word. I shall now, with your permission... Be the first to cross the bridge. Half a minute, old chap. I can't allow that. Do my ears deceive me, Lord John? You can't allow it. Listen, old chap. Look over at those bushes. Well, sir? We're invading enemy territory, don't you see? It may be all right over there. Oh, of course it's but all right. But there may be a tribe of cannibals waiting for lunchtime. We haven't got rifles. We haven't got anything. Then what do you suggest? Malone and I will climb down again, fetch up the rifles. Oh, this delay is intolerable. I know, old chap. But better learn wisdom. Or you get served up as veal stew. Oh, speaking of that, we'll also fetch up Manua Gomez with provisions. Then you can cross the bridge while we cover you with the rifles. This is good sense, Professor Challenger. I am not aware, sir, that I need to be instructed in good sense by you or anyone else. But I do agree that a certain elementary course... Is... Oh, very well, go and get the rifles, but hurry, hurry! <laughs> Ready now, everybody? Quite ready, Lord John. As for me, Lord John, I await your lordship's gracious permission to cross the tree bridge. Had I been aware that your lordship's permission was necessary at the beginning of this adventure... All right, old chap, don't get your temper up. No. Gomez! Yes, senor? You and Manuel stay here when the rest of us go over. We may need to give you some instructions. True, senor. You may need to give instructions. Yes. Ready with the rifles, everybody else? All right, Professor Challenger, you first. Ah. <coughs> Sit down carefully, ah. sir. Don't lose your grip. I have no intention, young man, of losing my grip, either mentally or physically. The position, I confess, is a trifle undignified. It is not suited... Easy now. Uh, it is not suited to the historical painting, which will no doubt one day be made of this momentous occasion. You next, Professor Summerley. Uh, I'm quite ready, gentlemen. Uh, if you'll sling two of those rifles round my neck. What's wrong, <laughs> Professor Summerley? <laughs> Has it occurred to you? Well, what? <laughs> Has it occurred to you that our friend Challenger, as he hops across there, looks exactly like a gigantic bullfrog? One moment, sir. Did you by any chance say what I thought you said? Don't stop, Professor Challenger. For God's sake, don't turn round. Did you say bullfrog, sir? Were my ears assailed by any mention of a bull? Go on, sir. Go on to the other side. I'm sorry, Professor Challenger, if the harmless joke offends you. Now, if you will continue over to the other side, I shall follow you uh, along the tree uh, like this. Easy uh, now. 
Both of you. Look here, Lord John. You don't think they're going to sit out in that tree and begin sloshing at each other a thousand feet above ground? I can't say. They're crazy enough for anything. It's all right. Challenger's over. Any sign of life in those bushes? No, I can't see any. Done it. Somebody's over. All right, now you're next, my lad. Go on, over you go. I don't like this a little bit. But if those two professors can go over and never turn a hair... Get, get careful. Get a good grip on the tree. That's right. And don't look down. It's looking down that gives you the vertigo. I've got vertigo already, thanks. Yeah, don't look down, I keep telling you. Oh. Don't look out. Oh. Oh. I'm all right, Lord John. Nearly slipped. Now follow your own advice, young fella. Don't look round. What's the matter? I'm just wondering, Lord John, what you think you're doing. Me, young fella? Yes, you. Oh, I'm walking across, young fella, like this. It's so much simpler, don't you think? And that was how, as the sun began to sink across the jungle, we first set foot on the lost world. No sign of life in all that green stillness. Not even the cawing of a bird. The last thing we saw as we looked back was Gomez standing motionless on the rock pinnacle, smiling at us. Ahead was a bolt of dense scrub, and we shouted congratulations to each other as we hurried forward. It was the last time we did congratulate ourselves on that evil day. Because when we had got no more than a dozen feet into the scrub, and I was nearest the edge of the cliff... What was that? I hesitate to pronounce an opinion, sir, when I can't see. Professor but... Challenger! Lord John! Professor Summerlee! Yes, what is it? Come here! Come back here! What is it? What's wrong? The bridge has gone. The bridge has gone? The fear serves. The tree slipped off the edge of the cliffs. It smashed to pieces a thousand feet below. Listen! <laughs> I sworn I'd heard that laugh before. You did hear it. It's the same laughing we heard in the gorge last night. That sounded like Gomez. It is Gomez, senores. It is your faithful Gomez. Where the devil is he? I am on the other side of the, what you call, cynical, senores. Where you can't see me and you can't shoot me. Who led you to this place? Manuel Alai. Who put the tree over the edge? <laughs> Challenger, just talk to the fellow, will you? Hold him there. I'm going to slip along the edge of the cliff where I can get a side shot at him with my rifle. Oh, John, wait. Let him go, young man. Let vengeance go its course. I ask you the meaning of this, Gomez. Answer, Lord John Roxanne. Ask him if he remembers shooting Lopez of the Putamayo River. I am the brother of Lopez, senores. Flail of the snake trailers is Lord John Roxton. Flail of Lord John Roxton, am I? Professor Challenger, I can see Roxton now. He's... I say this last to you, and then I go away. You will die up there, senores. Cut off from the world. You will die up there because Lord John Roxton has shot my brother. And now at last I... Ah! Lord John Roxton, they say, is a dead shot. Yes. Where's Manuel? He was with Gomez. Something tells me, with peculiar clearness, gentlemen, that we shall not be troubled with either of them any longer. Excellent, Professor Challenger. Very good indeed. And doesn't it tell you anything else? Anything else? You brought us to the ends of the earth, sir. You gratify me, Professor Summerlee. Your ingenuity has shown us a way to a land of monsters. But with that bridge gone, can your ingenuity show us any way down? By the Lord's mercy, sir, you've really done it this time. We're marooned. For a moment, we stood staring at each other in bewilderment. Marooned in a mysterious land in which lay unknown terrors. Marooned without supplies without any hope of contacting the outside world. In our first brief panic, however, we had forgotten the Negro's ambo, and it was his voice calling across that 40-foot gap which restored us to our senses. Master! Master! Can you hear me, sir? Master! 
Zambo! Zambo! You hear me? Yes, Master. I'm here. You perceive, I hope, that we are in a somewhat precarious position. Now, look here, old chappy. We won't understand that highfalutin talk. Look, am I the leader of this expedition, or am I not? All right, all right. But speak so you can get the hang of what you're saying. I shall make myself perfectly clear. Zambo! You observe, no doubt, the critical nature of our situation. Yes, Master. Maybe ghosts get you. What ghosts? Oh, be quiet, Professor Somebody. You have the rope there, Zambo. Rope, no good, Master. You tend to make better thoughts. I know that, my good Zambo. Well, then what's the game? Would you tell us? Throw one end of the rope across to us. Then tie the other one as many boxes of provisions. An ammunition as you can bring up. We'll drag them over to this side. Don't forget to include a camera. Did you say a camera, Professor Challenger? Yes, Professor Summerley, I said a camera. I want photographic evidence if something should attack us. Attack us? If, in short, a flesh-eating dinosaur should step out of these bushes now. Zambo, don't forget the elephant gun cartridges, will you? No, Chief. I don't forget. And you won't leave your post. Why not? Too much afraid thought. You be careful. That thought was in our minds when we slept for our first night on the lost world. We supped and camped at the very edge of the cliff among some bushes. These bushes turned out, however, to be infested with enormous blood ticks, as I found out to my cost in the morning. Most oh. interesting, Mr. Malone. That blood tick on your leg, which you have so unfortunately crushed. Good Lord, Professor Summerley, did you think I was going to let that vile thing stay where it was? Look at all the blood which squirted out when I picked it off and burst it. My blood, sir. Mine. Steady on, young fellow, my lad. It's rotten luck we settled on this spot. Might have known there'd be some pretty diabolical insect life in these bushes. Well, Mr. Malone should be proud to be chosen. We cannot do less than call this first fruit of our labours Exodes Maloni. A very small inconvenience of being bitten, my young friend. Cannot, I'm sure, weigh with you as against the glorious privilege of having your name inscribed in the deathless roll of zoology. Unhappily, you have crushed this fine specimen. Fine specimen? Filthy vermin, you mean? You should cultivate the scientific eye and the detached mind, Mr. Malone. To a man of philosophic temperament like myself, the blood tick, with its lancet-like proboscis and its distending stomach, is as beautiful a work of nature as the peacock or the aurora borealis. It pains me to hear you speak of it in so unappreciative a fashion. No doubt, with due diligence, we can secure some other specimen. There can be no doubt of that, Professor Challenger. One has just disappeared behind your shirt collar. What? Hmm? Oh, gang! <laughs> <laughs> the bushes were full of the horrible pests, and it was clear that we must shift our camp. We moved to a small clearing, thickly surrounded by trees on all sides. There were some flat slabs of rock in the center with a spring of water close by. Here, we made our first plans for the invasion of this new country, surrounded by our ammunition and enough provisions to last for several weeks. This was to be our headquarters, our place of refuge against sudden danger and a guardhouse for our stores. Fort Challenger, we called it. The others slept that night, round a dying campfire that threw gleams among the great trees round about. But I can't say I slept much. It was towards morning, in the hour of suicides and bad dreams, that suddenly... Good Lord! Look out! Get away, you swine! <sighs> what is this? Somebody call out. Easy, Easy, young fellow, my lad. Now, what's wrong? I don't want you to think I'm out of my mind, but I saw something. Professor Summerley, will you poke up that fire? Now, you saw what? A white face. A human face. All right. Now, where did you see it? In that big tree there, with the branches like ferns. The branches parted and the face looked down. It was flat and white, and it had a body like a reddish pig. Uh, you were dreaming, young fellow. I wasn't dreaming, I tell you. But a human face? A human face or an ape's. That's it, an ape's, only without any hair and with curved teeth. The anthropoid ape, young man, is unknown in South America. Are you quite sure of this? Absolutely sure. Had this creature a tail? No. Uh, did you notice whether it could cross its thumb over its palm? Hang it all, sir. I only got a brief glimpse, then I threw a stone and it swung away. Well, that was very hasty of you, my boy. Very hasty and injudicious. 
Had you been able to coax it down Coax here, it down? That's what I said. It was the evilest looking brute I ever saw in my life. You didn't want me to invite the damn thing to breakfast. In the interests of science, young man. As a scientist myself, sir, I agree with Malone. You agree with Malone, sir? I agree with Malone, sir. Have you forgotten the skeleton? What skeleton? The skeleton of the man thrown from these cliffs and impaled on the bamboo points a thousand feet below. Listen. Is that the sound it made? Yes. But if there are any more of these brutes hanging about watching us... They're very probably are. Well, then we've got to walk softly and look sharp. As soon as it's daylight, we begin our exploration. In which direction? Following the course of the stream, naturally. That will always lead us back to camp. We can surround our stores with thorn hedges. Then, when we penetrate into that forest in full daylight... Very little forest, I should say. Swamp, swamp, and nothing but swamp. Shall we turn back? Turn back? Why? I see no plant life of interest to the bottom. Only the swamp and our own footprint. Stop a bit. Well, Lord John? Not only our own footprint. <laughs> Look at that. What? Now do you believe, Professor Summerlee? Now is your small conceit broken. I... I... What in the name of sense is it? A three-toed footprint. Well, I see that. Confound it, but the thing must be four times the size of an elephant. What sort of a bird leaves a track like that? Not a bird, Lord John. A reptile. A reptile with... To be exact, a dinosaur. You, Professor Summerlee, you call me a liar now in face of these tracks. I must confess, Professor Challenger, I really must confess. Surely these tracks are wheeled and wheeled. Exactly. Meaning what? This is a creature walking erect on three-toed feet and occasionally putting one of its five-fingered forepaws to the ground. Now, if we were to see one of these animals... We're going to see one, old chap. How so? Because I swear these tracks are fresh. Shh! Creep forward, all of you. Look through this screen of brushwood. Is it? Yes, my friend. The denizens of the lost world. There were five of them. Like a nightmare in daylight. Scaled like lizards, with witless rolling eyes that seemed to look at us through the brush. They sat up on their haunches in that blade and browsed on tree branches as a rabbit browses on lettuce. Stare of their eyes, shocked. It was like the dragon you dreamed about as a child. The forepaws struck and slashed at the tree branches. When one fell down on its feet, you could feel a tug as the ground shook. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. Oh, am I seeing things? Do you question, sir, the evidence of your own eyes? One moment. Don't fire. Why not? In the first place, the sound of a shot might alarm the whole countryside. I know that, but if I could get one head, look, just one head to take home with me. Oh, sporting one would turn green. What about the newspaper readers? Look there, Professor. If I just drilled the nearest one and looked straight through the eye. You still wouldn't hurt him. Well, not even with this gun? Not even with that gun. Have you got the camera, Mr. Muller? Yes, but I can't even get the blighters into the viewfinder. It's too big. Keep down. They'll see us. And you, Professor Summerlee, I can scarcely wonder that your eyes bulge and that your mockery of a pure intelligence returns to haunt you. What do you say? Professor Challenger, I apologize. Professor Summerlee, your apology is accepted. Oh, wait a minute, you two. Look, don't stand up, not to shake hands with the brutes right on top of us. Look out! That one came down with all his paws at once. It won't come down on us with the arm. Like an elephant walking on a grave. Yes. But they seem harmless enough. My dear sir, they are harmless. The iguanodon? The what? The iguanodon, Lord John. You'll find his prehistoric footprints all over the sands in Kent and Sussex. He's charming and childlike, like our friend Malone. He's all brawn and no brain. Observe the nearest one. Well, not too close, thanks. But see, there. He reaches after a bunch of foliage too high in the tree. He can't reach it. So he uproots the whole tree. <coughs> and the tree crashes over on top of them. The 
whole tribe take fright and run. The brief thunder of their passing, the gleam of slaty scales, and the glade is empty. What will they say to this in England? Oh, my dear Samuel, I can tell you with great confidence exactly what they will say. They'll say that you are an infernal liar, just as you said a minute. Why, in the face of photographs? Oh, faked, Samuel, clumsily faked. In the face of specimens. Ah, there we may have them. Malone and his filthy Fleet Street crew may be all yelping our praises yet. The day we saw five live iguanodons in a glade of maple white land. Put it down in your journal, my young friend, and send it to your rag. I'll be ready to get the toe end of the editorial boot in return. Things look a bit different from the latitude of London, young fella. All this will seem a bit of a dream to ourselves in a month or two. I can't see us being able to lead an iguanodon back, show it off in Hyde Park. You're quite right, Lord John. <laughs> There's hardly any likelihood we shall get back ourselves. In the meantime, there's nowhere to go but forward. We may have traveled a mile or more, keeping to the bank of the stream. A belt of brushwood led up to a tangle of rocks at the top of that boulder-strewn slope. Gray and eerie the place looked, with its graveyard rocks. Lord John was well ahead, scouting. We saw him get to the top of that slope. Then we saw him drop down suddenly as though he'd been shot and peer over the edge. What is it, Professor Challenger? I don't know. He's signaling us to stop. Listen. Well? Perhaps it was my imagination, but I could have sworn I heard a kind of... Kind of what? That well, doesn't matter now. Lord John is coming back. Lord John? He's in it. Shh. Keep quiet. Is anything wrong? Well, listen, all of you, you want to see something, you'll raise your hair. Just crawl up and look over the edge of those rocks. Crouch down and don't make a noise. What is it? Forward now. That's it. Keep low. What is it? I insist on knowing. Do you hear anything, Lord John? All of you must hear it now. I hear something. You hear the devil's nursery, old chap. Devil's nursery? It's a volcanic pit, like a big bowl in the rocks, with green scummy water at the bottom. And in that pit... Well? Pterodactyls. Thousands of them. Pterodactyls? Well, don't you remember that flapping thing with wings 20 feet long? I saw it over the trees the other day. I do indeed remember the pterodactyl. Professor Summerlee said it was a stork. I said, sir. Do you deny you said it was a stork? Keep quiet, for God's sake. A doctor is. Right, George, neither Dr. Illingworth nor anybody else ever saw a sight like this. Crouch down and look over the edge. The place was a breeding ground of pterodactyls. The rocks and the water seemed to hundreds of specimens like medieval devils. Hideous mothers brooded over their leathery, yellowish eggs and watched their young in the water. On the higher rocks sat the horrible males. They sat absolutely motionless, except for the rolling of their red eyes or a snap of their rat trap beaks as a dragonfly went past. Professor Challenger, I ask your pardon again. This is worth risking everything to see. Refreshing, is it not? Very refreshing. The flood of light it throws on the habits of the pterodactyl. Shh, keep down, you two. Observe the dead fish and birds among the rocks. This proves the gariest, my dear sir, like penguin. Not a doubt. If we could perhaps have a closer view of the eggs. Why not? I'll tell you why not. Well, aren't you interested, Lord John? Interested? Yes, I'm interested in the soil around the edge of that water. Blue volcanic clay, ain't it? I believe so. Why? Well, never mind, but if you want to start something you can't finish, just stick your head up and say pretty, pretty to a nest of pterodactyl. There is, of course, a certain amount of danger. A certain amount? They'll come diving down on us with teeth like bread knives. Not <laughs> with the care I take, Lord John. Oh, no, old chap. No. I rather pride myself on my ability to stalk unseen as quietly as a shadow. I can put my hand on this loose boulder, for instance, and rest my weight on it without once disturbing. Look out! It's a curse to me, Professor Those Challenger. Those brutes are spreading their wings. They're going out. It's a curse to me, Professor Challenger. We've been a run for it. Run for it, sir. Science or no science, yes. Make for the wood and keep together. If we get among the trees, sit him alone. Yes, sir. And about the camera? Yes. Certainly, but photograph it. I yes. implore you to photograph that fine specimen coming down for his now. He's driving at a mile a minute, Doc. <laughs>
Now, come on, make with the trees, all of you. If anybody talks science, I'll brain him. Now, run. We staggered through the brushwood, and even as we reached the trees, the harpies were on us again. Summerlee was not down. We tore him up and rushed among the trunks. Once there, we were safe, for those huge wings had no space for their sweep beneath the branches. As we limped homeward, sadly mauled, we saw them for a long time flying at a great height against the blue sky, soaring round and round, no bigger than wood pigeons. Their eyes went out still following us. At last, as we reached the thicker woods, they gave up the chase and we saw them no more. We halted beside a brook to bathe our wounds. Uh, uh, well, a most interesting uh, and convincing experience, gentlemen. Uh, we are exceptionally well informed, Summerley, as to the habits of the enraged pterodactyl. Yes, indeed. It's worth noting that our young friend has received an undoubted stab, Ow! while Lord John's coat could only have been torn by a bite. <laughs> Professor Summerley has a nasty cut on his forehead, and I myself have been beaten about the head by the wing. Yes, we have indeed had a remarkable exhibition of the pterodactyl's various methods of offence. Well, it was such and go for our lives, and I can't think of a more rotten sort of death than to be oosted by such filthy vermin. I'm sorry to fire my rifle, but by Jove, there was no great choice. We should not be here if you hadn't, Lord John. May do no harm. Among those woods, there must be many loud cracks from falling trees, which may sound like a gun. Now, I think we'd had enough thrills for one day. The quicker we get back to camp in the surgical box, the better. We don't know what venom may have been in those hideous jaws. I must confess, gentlemen, I'm rather glad to see our camp again. Just a minute. Somebody's been here. How do you mean? The thorn hedge has been disturbed. Somebody's handled the tins of provisions. Built a box of cartridges. Somebody? You mean... Apes? I don't know. Is anything else going to happen? But it wouldn't surprise me. When it gets dark, all sorts of things could be looking at us from those trees. We better get a fire going at once. Oh, this, sir, is mere superstition. You think so? What we need, sir, is food. The minds and spirits of all men, even including myself, are depressed by long exertion without sustenance. Good meal, a night's sleep, and tomorrow morning. One I... moment. Yes, Professor Summerlee. May I suggest, sir, that we sit down and call a conference here and now? A conference? Yes. For some plan of immediate strategy. Oh, by all means, if you insist. You agree, Lord John? Blue volcanic planet. You forget? Uh, oh, uh, sorry, old chap. I, I, I was wool gathering. Yeah, go, go ahead. Several references, I believe, have been made to Professor Challenger's giant brain. Oh, come down, no modesty for bits. Very well. I suggest he employ this giant brain on some scheme for getting us off this plateau. He got us here. Now let him get us away. And our exploration of the plateau? That must stop, sir. Here and now. Are you mad, sir? No, sir. We came here, if you remember, with a perfectly definite purpose, to find out whether or not you were telling the truth. And you did find out? Yes, I admit. Thank you. That mission is now fulfilled. We can't explore the plateau, and you know it. It'll require a large expedition and special equipment. You know, Challenger, there is truth in that. The plateau is huge. It's thickly wooded with immense trees. Why, we could blunder here for weeks and still have no notion of the geography. Thickly wooded with huge trees. Geography? By George! What's wrong with you, young fellow? Huge trees, I've got it. Good what? Look at that tree there. The one where I saw the ape last night. It must be a hundred feet high. Well? If I climbed up there tomorrow morning with a notebook and pencil... You, you you could see out over the whole plateau. And draw a map of everything. Then we'd have real data, the whole geography for an exploring party later. That's not bad. Not bad at all. Worthy, if I may say so, of a more enlightened intelligence has ever been shown by a journalist in all the history of your repulsive tribe. 
Will this satisfy you, Professor Summerlin? If you agree to stop exploring, yes. Then there is nothing, I think, that will trouble us further. <laughs> I wonder. When I devote the powers of my own intellect to our descent from the plateau, the problem is as good as solved. In the meantime, we take our ease by a good campfire in the starless night outside. There's nothing to menace us now, nothing to trouble our slumbers in all the vast peace and quiet. Listen, wait. Somebody. What on earth was that? Nothing to trouble our slumbers. Bah, 